Hey everyone, so this video is going to start a larger conversation about how we can actually uh, get data out of files into our program and put data from memory that our program was working with back into files so that we can work with data that's being stored long term. So in this video, I want to focus on introducing a few terms and getting sort of the general idea of what's going on when we're actually working with files. Uh, you know, sort of give you that idea before I actually start getting into the specifics. I also want to motivate why we would want to start working with files. So that's my plan for this. I plan to cover section 9.1 from the focus part of the chapter, which is just about sequential access files. So when we're actually running our application, when the user is giving us data that we are working with, such as by typing into a text box or pressing controls or all that kind of stuff, we are storing a whole bunch of data in memory. All that data being things like whether or not certain checkboxes are checked or the text that a user has typed in or a selection in a list box or anything like that. All that kind of stuff is stored in memory. Uh, that is sort of the primary storage of the computer. Every time you run a program on your computer, it is storing things in memory like that. Uh, it is quote unquote close to the CPU. There's not a lot of electronics separating the CPU from your actual main memory. So it's pretty efficient to work with, which is really great. The problem, however, is that when we actually turn off the computer, the data that's kept in memory is completely lost. It goes away and we have no idea, you know, what it used to hold. Um, and the same even goes for when we stop running a program. So if you are running your application and then you close it, uh, you can't actually get any of the information that the user entered previously back again. Um, you know, maybe it's still sticking around in memory until the computer turns off, but it's not accessible. That being said, um, most of the time it just will be completely overwritten as other programs start to need some of that memory instead. So the computer is not going to hold on to it for you. So you've practically just lost any data that your user gave you as soon as you close your application. And especially as soon as the computer is turned off. Now there's a couple solutions uh, we could try to think about in order to store data long-term. Uh, we could try to find a way to always keep memory powered, and that was actually the case with some early laptops back in the day, was that they would try to keep memory powered, uh, you know, essentially put the laptop into a hibernation state rather than a full shutdown state, uh, keep the memory powered by using battery power, and then just turn the computer back on and um, you know, have everything that was in memory still available to you, and that works fine until the battery actually runs out, in which case you just lose everything, which is a problem. So that doesn't work so well, especially in the modern day and age. Uh, our other possible solution is to find a way to store it long-term, which is what we ended up doing through all of our history of computing, is we just store data long-term using other methods. So when we store our data, we use what's known as secondary storage. This stores data when the computer is not powered, and it's taken a lot of forms over the years. It might be um, tape, so reel-to-reel -reel or cassettes. Um, that's all been used in various iterations of computing over the years. You might use magnetic disks, so things like floppy disks, or even the HDDs that you might still have in your computers nowadays. Uh, flash memories like USB flash drives or SSDs, which are much more common in computers nowadays, or even optical media like CDs, DVDs, and Blu-rays were used as secondary storage. Uh, so all of these would hold data long term in a relatively stable way so that the computer could still interact with that data. Now the thing with the secondary storage like this is that the computer is often not able to directly interface with that data, um, especially with things like the magnetic disks or the tapes or the optical media. It's physically stored in that media, 
using some kind of physical property, and then the computer has to use sensors in order to interpret that physical property, such as magnetic fields or the way that um, the light of a laser kind of shines around when it's uh, reflected off of the pits and grooves of a CD or anything like that. You know, it has to interpret those physical signs into data and essentially recreate the data that was stored onto this physical uh, medium. But what that's doing is it's essentially um, reading that physical data, recreating everything, and storing all of that data back into primary memory. So secondary storage isn't a direct interface, but rather it's something that holds onto data so that the computer can load it back into primary memory. And then in that primary memory, uh, it can be interfaced with via whatever programs are being used to interact with it. So data, when we store it uh, on secondary storage like this, is stored as a sequence of quote-unquote characters that have some meaning. Um, the textbook uses the term characters, but they don't really mean characters as in, you know, letters or numbers or things like that. They mean characters as bytes of data. So these... Um, bytes of data, you know, any uh, eight bits sort of smashed together into one byte, and then you have um, many bytes uh, laid out in a sequence across our secondary storage. When you put all of those bytes together, they create some kind of file with some meaning. Uh, they reference characters here because characters typically were one byte back in the day, and now they're multiple bytes, but... Um, not all data is stored as recognizable characters like letters or numbers or things like that. Some of these um, characters are actually just uh, weird symbols or even something that doesn't have a proper symbol whatsoever. And it just looks like kind of a mess if you try to open it up in a text editor or something. Just because of the fact that, you know, those bytes of data just don't line up with any sort of representation of actual uh, characters, the way we represent characters using binary data, but that's kind of a bit of an aside. Uh, they're stored as this sequence of characters. That's sort of the, the term that we use right there. It's a bit of a holdover from some of the earlier days of computing, but that doesn't mean that data is stored as actual words uh, on your computer or anything like that. They might be stored as something that just looks like complete junk, and I'll try to show that off in just a bit. But yeah, they're stored as a sequence. That's the really important part. All of these bytes of data are stored in order to some extent. They're sometimes chunked and broken up uh, into these like smaller chunks so that they can be uh, fit into memory a lot easier, but then they're pieced together in order again when you're actually trying to work with them with a file. That's neither here nor there for this topic. Essentially, when you open up a file with a program. The program reads all of the data for that file in order, following you know the order of this sequence of characters. The order of everything is what gives that uh, data meaning. If that data was rearranged, it wouldn't really have the same meaning anymore because it's not, you know, that ordering, it, it kind of just destroys the information if you mess with the ordering. So that's what's important. It's a sequence of characters that have some kind of meaning. That's how data is stored on secondary storage like this. So this brings us to a discussion of files. Um, our modern understanding of computers includes a this idea known as a file system, which is a way that we actually organize data on our secondary storage in order for us to be able to much more easily find it and open our files after we've already saved data. Um, it would be extremely painful if we didn't have a file system. So something like the system of folders within folders within folders that tell us where all of our files are on our computer. Uh, imagine instead if you had to reference the um, disk number and then the sector number and then the actual position within the sector of that disk in order to get a partial piece of your file and then follow some sort of path that leads you to the next sector on some other disk that has some pieces of the file as well and so on and so forth. It would be extremely complicated 
to just open up a picture of your cat on your computer. Because that thing could be chunked to hundreds of pieces depending on how fragmented your hard drive is and that would be a disaster. So instead we let the operating system worry about that for us and then the operating system abstracts it all into our system of folders that contain files and then our files we can actually access using programs. So all that is to say that a file is a sequence of bytes or characters that holds information and it's all sort of um this whole sequence holds information specifically related to one thing either it's one picture of a cat or one document that you're writing for school or one program that you are running to browse the web or something like that but um that's essentially what a file is. It's just a sequence of bytes. It holds information. Uh, music and videos are also files on your computer, assuming that you still use uh, music and video files rather than just streaming services, but they are files. Programs are files that are located on your computer and programs probably also use other files that are located on your computer as well as part of running on your computer, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but your files, uh, you um, essentially will maybe be working on some project in Microsoft Word or downloading something from your web browser, hopefully Firefox or something like that. So that all gets saved in your memory and then it gets stored from memory in secondary storage. So when you're working with something it is held in memory and then when you are done working with it if you want to actually save that data it gets copied over to secondary storage uh, and then when you actually want to start working with that file again it gets loaded from secondary storage into memory um, so that's how this whole thing works. You store data from memory in secondary storage, and then you load data from secondary storage into memory. And this even works for programs. So the thing with programs is that they are files that contain instructions that tell your computer how to run um, that program. Uh, and when you're done running your program, you might want to be able to run the program again later on, right? So you want to be able to store those instructions somewhere. And then when you try to run the program, those instructions get loaded into memory and then the CPU actually starts reading them out of memory. So that's how that works. The programs themselves are still files just like that. Now, when you are trying to open up a file, the computer by itself doesn't actually know what that file is. It can't really tell the difference between a photo and a Word document and a program and an MP3 file for music or a video or anything like that. It doesn't know by itself what that thing is. It just knows that there's data there and that data is kind of related to every other piece of data in that sort of files location in some way that you know means it contains information um so the cpu doesn't know what that actual file is but what you have to do is you have to specify a program to actually open up that file and that program will give the CPU instructions on how to actually interpret the file. And then once the CPU is able to interpret the file, then it's able to recognize what the file does and how to best present that data to you. So let's say VLC Media Player or iTunes or something like that are going to help the CPU interpret a uh, media file either a music or a video file, it will help the CPU recognize, hey, this is an MP3 file or a FLAC file or a MP4 or an MKV video. 
Um, and then it will give the CPU instructions on how to actually play that song or play that movie or something like that. Uh, Microsoft Word will give the CPU instructions on how to interpret a Word document, how to actually decompress it and then start displaying all of the um, text and formatting and stuff correctly to you via the window uh, and all that kind of stuff. So that's the role of the program right there is that the program actually provides the CPU instructions on how to interpret it. Uh, a program itself, the uh, when you're trying to run some application that you've downloaded, uh, that's actually going to be interpreted by the operating system itself, which will then pass the instructions to the CPU. Uh, but all of that uh, aside, we use the file type of a program, whether that's .txt, .docx, whatever. Um, we use that file type to tell the operating system what program to load the file with. So the if I um, double click on a file, then the operating system will look at the file type, determine what type of file it is, and then look at the list of default applications that are supposed to handle a file of that type, run that application, pass it that file, and then give all that information to the CPU to start actually running everything. So that is how the computer deals with files on your computer. Now I want to sort of get into the idea of the sequential access file, which is the, uh, the type of file that is accessed uh, in order from the first to the last byte. So I talked about how files are a sequence of bytes. They have a very particular order that determines, you know, how all the data is arranged within the file and that kind of gives it meaning, that ordering. Well, when you access a sequential access file, you're accessing it starting at the first byte and going in that order. You're following that sequence. Now, there are cases where some files are not accessed sequentially like this. We'll never come across that, so we really don't need to worry about that. For all intents and purposes, we only care about sequential access files right here. We access them in order. When we have a program open up one of these types of files, um, it will start at the very beginning and read data until it gets to the very end. It's reading everything in order and then processing all of that information in terms of how it's you know supposed to actually handle that file based on the type of file, based on the program, all that kind of stuff. Now, there's a type of sequential access file known as the text file, and these uh, files contain only plain text, uh, pretty much. So alphanumeric characters, symbols, control characters, all that kind of stuff, you just type them out and they are displayed very plainly. They are not including formatting, so there's no bold or italic, nothing like that, no strike through, no underline, no fonts, anything. There's no images, there's no you know margins or bullet points or anything like that, it is just text in a file. Nothing more, nothing less. So that specifically is called a text file. So there are some uh, file extensions that you might recognize that are associated with text files. The .txt is the most common extension for a text file. Uh, it's just the text extension, typically. Uh, a lot of source code for programs, though, are also text files. So the .vb files that you create when you're creating a Visual Basic program, those are also text files. All they contain is just regular text, but the .vb extension tells the computer that this specifically contains source code for a Visual Basic program, and therefore it should be opened with Visual Studio and then compiled to make a Visual Basic program. A similar thing with the .csv file right, right here, which is just plain text, but uh, CSV stands for comma separated values, which is a way of defining a table of information where you just write everything out in each of the cells in plain text, and then you separate each of the cells in a row with commas, and then you separate the rows with a new line. It's a very simple format, and they're really great because, you know, 
they hold all this information in plain text, but then they can be easily transformed into an Excel spreadsheet or into any other type of um, tabular data that might be used by various programs that kind of deal with this sort of two-dimensional data like that. So CSVs are really easy, you know, it's really easy to convert them into 2D arrays. It's really easy to use them in Access as well as Excel. It's easy to use them for any number of programming languages where you have, where you can uh, define your own custom way of taking in data like that, all that kind of stuff. They're very flexible in a way that an Excel sheet is not because Excel sheets kind of muck things up a little bit. They, they, they compress the data in a really weird way that doesn't allow programming languages to easily deal with them. Uh, and then HTML uh, files, all of the files that define what websites look like, or at least they used to. Nowadays, it's a little more complicated because of JavaScript and whatnot, but HTML files are also plain text. The files that get sent from servers to your computer to load, uh, to show you websites and all that kind of stuff, that is all plain text like that. Some examples of files that are not text files include the docx file format. So Word documents are not actually text files. Even though they contain text, they're not actually because they have this weird sort of compression thing going on where, um, you know, they, they compress together all of the text and all of the formatting and stuff that you want to put in. And if it was just the text and the formatting, you actually could make that a text file. But then they also include things like images and then some other weird files that kind of fall outside the realm of text files. So docx files, because they have, you know, because they take all of that kind of stuff and then they also compress it, uh, that data is no longer recognizable as text. So it by itself is not a text file. Although it does technically contain a text file within it, it gets a little bit weird the way that they handle docx files, but it's like a compressed format where there is text contained within it, but then there's also things that are not text contained within it. Um, same with Excel spreadsheets. So the .xlsx uh, format, that's not a text file as well because of that whole compression thing. Uh, images, music, movies, that kind of stuff. So the .png format is an image format. The .mp3 file uh, format is a music format. Uh, MP4 or MKV would be video formats, right? All of those are not text files because they all just contain uh, binary data that is used to, uh, you know, it, it's interpreted by a an image viewing program or a music or video playing program in order to actually give you the image or the music or the video, but it doesn't actually have text in it. it, it, it the majority of it is going to be just binary data that we can't look at and interpret at all. It's all just nonsense to us if we try to look at it. And I'll try to show that off. So this is a program called Notepad. It's a part of Microsoft Windows and you actually use it to create text files of your own. Uh, it's very simple. All you do is you open it and you start typing. So this is a line of text, oh, text. Uh, press enter. This is another line of text and so on and so forth. Uh, so you are just storing regular text in here. Nothing fancy, no formatting, no fonts, font size, bold, italics, whatever. No images, nothing like that is in there. And this program, the way that it interprets files is it interprets them very directly using a style of encoding. Um, that's essentially baked into the file. So it, the encoding is, um, I don't know if you can see it down here, it's called UTF-8. This is basically the way in which data is stored and then interpreted in order to go from text to binary numbers and then back into text and all that kind of stuff. But that's what Notepad does is it um, interprets data very directly as characters and then displays those characters to you. And then when you type stuff into Notepad and then save it, it saves 
those characters uh, directly as very simple binary values for UTF-8 that would be as bytes of data and it stores them in order so it would store T H I S space I S and so on and so forth in order until it comes to this final period at the very end. However the cool thing about notepad is that you can trick it into actually trying to open up other types of files. So for example um, I can have it open up, uh, where is it? This Visual Basic code file right here, .vb, this is from chapter six when I was actually showing off the differences between pass by reference and pass by value right here. But this is the actual source code that I wrote in Visual Studio for this. And as you can see, it is a text file. It is able to be opened by Notepad, which is known as a text editor. So text editors open text files just like this. And these types of files are the ones that we're going to be focusing on for this chapter. Now this right here is a Word document. Uh, this is actually my syllabus for CBiz 112 for spring 2023. Um, and you know, there's a lot of text right here, but you can see all this formatting and stuff. There's uh, different font sizes. We have this uh, is formatted as a title. Uh, there's centered text here, there's bold text here, there's all these uh, different fonts and font sizes and all that kind of stuff. Um, so this would not be a text file. And to show that it's not a text file, I'll actually show you what it looks like when you open it in a text editor. This is the exact same file. Uh, you might not be able to see, but the title in Notepad does say that it's opening up my syllabus, the docx file, but you have all of this garbage looking data right here. I'll try to zoom in a little bit. Um, you have all these weird symbols and stuff everywhere. It's just complete nonsense. And there's not a single piece of recognizable text to be had. And this is due to that. Um, oh, there's some recognizable text actually right, right here and right here and stuff. But this has to do with some of that compression that I was talking about the way that uh, word documents are actually sort of compressed and the um, actual text itself is kind of obscured because of that. Uh, we have the result of what happens when you try to open up a picture in a text editor like this. A text editor will always assume that a pro that any file you're opening up is some sort of text uh, as you can see down here possibly there's this ansi file format um which it's not actually an ansi text file it just thinks it is but they're you know it's trying to interpret this uh, jpeg image as a text file and there is some recognizable text uh, this exif data right here and this google ink thing and all that kind of stuff. That's information about uh, my phone, which was actually what took the picture. But um, this, you know, most of this is just meaningless garbage because it tried to take data that was meant to encode a picture, which is what we see when we open it in a proper picture viewing application. But then it's trying to interpret all of that as text, which is improper because it actually isn't text but the program doesn't know that it's not text uh and because of that the cpu itself doesn't know that it's not text so it just it does what it's told it follows the instructions and interprets it as if it were text now the operating system would normally uh recognize that this is a, J a jpeg file and open up uh my cat's adorable face in a picture viewing software like what I have right here. In fact, that's actually how I got this picture up is I just double clicked her picture and it opened up in this image right here. I had to manually open up the picture in Notepad to make it work and actually, you know, bypass the operating system in order to take a look at the inside. So the operating system is the piece that recognizes what type of file is opened up by what. But you know, this is a bit of a closer view of what the actual data looks like um, right here. And you know what's also funny is that we have all these different lines of text, 
But these lines right here are completely accidental. Because, you know, what happens here is all of these are just binary values that are holding information about the picture and they all accidentally get interpreted as their respective characters. So, for example, this is accidentally getting interpreted as an A and this is accidentally getting interpreted as an at symbol and stuff like that. The enters are accidentally getting interpreted as new lines, all that kind of stuff. Uh, none of this has any sort of meaning whatsoever as plain text. The only meaning comes when we interpret it correctly and display it as a JPEG image. And then the last thing I can do is try to show you what a program looks like when you open up in a text editor, because this also gives you an idea of what it looks like to actually, you know, peer behind the scenes and take a closer look at binary data, sort of. Uh, so I'm actually going to scroll down right here, winword.exe. Open that up. What I had to do was change from text documents to all files over here, if you're ever curious about looking at binary data like that. And then it's going to take a while to actually start opening up. And there we go. This is what Microsoft Word looks like when you actually open it up in a text editor. There's still all of this garbage text. And there's a lot of garbage text. Um, and there's also non-garbage text in here, which is actually kind of funny. Um, you have stuff like unknown exception right here, battery, new length, MSI provided component X, w, you know, all that kind of stuff. But you have all these neat little um, fragments. And what you could possibly do as well uh, is uh, open up your own applications in Notepad and see what kind of uh, garbage data there is, but also look at the data that's not garbage. See, you know, are there any particular strings that are left alone or are there any errors that are left alone or anything like that? It's a really neat thing to do to look at how a program is kind of constructed. But again, what we have here is a text editor trying to treat an application as regular text, trying to interpret all of this binary data as if it was regular text and running into a lot of issues like all these weird symbols, you know, these weird fractions and stuff up here, or this uh, weird box, which could be any number of symbols, all these spaces, uh, if there's any tabs in here somewhere, the enters, all that kind of stuff are just completely accidental byproducts of the, um, you know, the fact that we are uh, working with an application file, a .exe file inside of Notepad. So what I wanted to really highlight with all of this is show the difference between a regular text file, like the .txt files or the .vb files that you've been working with in Visual Studio, and a lot of the other types of files that we have, including docx, including .exe, and so on and so forth. All right, so now let's talk about input and output. I've talked about input and output before, where input is data that you get into your program and output is data that you produce from your program. So input might be stuff you get from your users as they interact with your controls and output is information that you display to them in labels or whatever. But we also have input and output in terms of files. So output files are files to which data is written. Um, you store data from your memory into output files, and you're essentially writing those files sequentially. You're writing them from the very beginning of that file to the very end. Um, most of the time, we'll get into the nuances of that in the next video. But output is when you put information from your program elsewhere. And in this case, you're putting information from your program's memory into secondary storage so that either the user can access it later or you can access it later, maybe load it back into your own program or something like that. But you are storing data from memory into a file using your program. And input files are files from which data is read. So you are given a file that has some sort of useful information that you need for whatever calculations you're performing. Uh, you load information into memory from that file in order to use it in the program. So it goes from secondary storage into your program's assigned memory space. 
uh, using variables. Uh, and then you read, you know, you're reading that file in order from beginning to end in order to get that data from secondary storage into memory. So you're reading it in order, putting it into memory as you read it, maybe processing it as you are um, holding it in memory, or maybe you process it, uh, you know, after you've done the entirety of the sucking it out of secondary storage and putting it into memory. So you could do it during or after, depending on your particular use case. Um, but that's the idea. Output files, you, you store memory from your program's uh, memory space into secondary storage. Input files, you load information from files, maybe something that the user gave you or something like that into your own program so that you can do calculations with it. And you might end up using both input and output, or you might only use one of these. You might only use input or only use output. Um, that depends on the scope of your program. And in the following videos, we are going to talk about how to work with output files and input files. So that's what's coming up. So that's an introduction to sequential access files. I went into some detail about uh, how things work sort of behind the scenes with computers. And I did go into a bit more detail than the textbook actually does regarding what a file actually is. But I hope that I give you a more complete picture that you can use to further your understanding of what's going on with a computer. Because when you understand how a computer is handling all this kind of stuff, I truly believe that it makes you a better programmer. So once you get a picture of how everything is working, then it'll be a lot easier to picture how you're working with these input and output files. So I hope all of this was helpful.